Delac and I will call this meeting of the Sustainability Commission to order. Welcome everyone. And let's um, let's start by a quick round of introduction. I am uh, Amy Delac, the chair of the commission, uh, apparently the newest reappointed member as of Monday night as well. <laughs> uh, to my left is Paul. Uh, hi, everybody. Paul Logue, planner for the city and uh, sustainability commission member. All right. Jasmine? Hello, I'm Jasmine Facoon. I am currently the resource assistant for the Bailey's Trail and a sustainability commission member. Megan? Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm Megan Almeida, and I am the Zero Waste Events Coordinator for Rural Action as well as part of the commission. Okay. Sam? Hi, everybody. Sam Crowell, um, Associate Director of Sustainability at Ohio University, and uh, I'm the City Council Representative to the Sustainability, Environment and Sustainability Commission. Thank you. Elaine? I, I am um, the Director of Energy Management and Sustainability at OU, as well as a member of the Sustainability Commission, and welcome to Meg for her first first meeting. Yeah. Uh, Austin. Uh, hi, um, I'm Austin Babro. I'm a retired, recently retired OU professor and member of the commission or committee. Abby. Hi, I'm Abby Rajam. I'm a Master's of Science in Environmental Studies student here at OU, and I am the student member of the commission. Great. And then we also have Scott Thompson and the official government channel aboard with us. It does not look like we have any other attendees at the moment. Uh, but let's go ahead uh, with the disposition of the minutes. Paul sent those around shortly before this meeting. Did anyone not get them? This was from the June meeting. Obviously, we didn't have a July meeting. Okay. Does anyone have edits, additions, or comments? With that, we'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes. So moved. Okay. And seconded? I'll second. Okay. That was Austin and Abby, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Sorry. And hey. all in favor? Oops, sorry. Did somebody have a comment? Yeah. Sorry. Comment? Later. Okay. <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, looks like our next meeting date will be September 2nd. That is the first Wednesday of September. Does anyone have an issue with that? Okay. Uh, just looking ahead, I will likely have an issue with the October meeting, but we can think about that uh, as the time comes. Oh, looks like we're getting Sarah on board. Hi, Sarah. Hey, Amy. Can you hear me? Yep. Want to Great. introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Uh, Sarah Conley Ballou. I uh, work at Rural Action and Commission Member. Great, thanks. We just did the minutes and uh, we're looking at the next meeting date, which is September 2nd, 6 p.m. I assume that will probably be via Zoom. Uh, we should at least probably plan for that anyway. Uh, anybody have an issue with that date and time? All right, hearing none, you're all on mute, which makes it easy. <laughs> um, hearing none, we'll, we'll plan for that as our next date. That moves us then down into old business, the first of which is the student data collection. So I do have um, some information from them. Uh, it took me a while to get it. I'll make sure to forward it out to everybody. Um, when I didn't want to spend too much time on it this evening since we um, wanted to make sure Jasmine had adequate time to present. Uh, real briefly though, if it's okay with uh, everybody, I can, I'll do a screen share and hopefully the PowerPoint okay. can come up so you we all can at least see the information that they collected for us. It looks pretty good. I w there's a couple of things we might want to double check. And um, however, um, uh, let me see if I can do this share screen here. And can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. 
me see. So basic stuff, you know, student, student uh, presentation. Um, their charge was to collect, collect the data. And probably what most of you are interested in is um, what I'm curious about as well is did they uh, collect the data? It looks like they did. Um, hmm. We'll need to double check all of this. This is the format that they put it in for me. It looks like, I don't know. I'll have to check that. There's a little voice sign there. I'm not sure. It doesn't seem to work when I press it, but if there's, I'm not sure if there's vocals attached to this or not. You're in a protected view, so you may need to download ah, the document. Thank you. Still nothing, but that's okay. So yeah, so it looks like we have some data. Great. Um, and I think we'll just need to double check to make sure that it looks consistent from where we've been as far as the reporting and, um, but otherwise, uh, looks like we're still working on the greenhouse gas, but I think we're, I think we're in good shape. Uh, I'll send this out to everybody. And, um, if we have additional questions and things that we want to look at, we can, uh, talk about it at the September meeting, if that okay. works for everyone. Great. Yeah. It looks like they did some comparisons too of Kent mm -hmm. and Burlington, Vermont. Yeah. Cool. Bowling green. Bowling green. I'm really impressed with what they've so. done. Bowling Green took theirs from ours, awesome. just so you all know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody from Bowling Green called me about a year and a half ago asking for information about how we did our plan, and I sent it over to them, and whoever it was was like, oh, this is perfect. Thank you. So, <laughs> now it's their plan, too. <laughs> I think <Great>. so. <laughs> Circular right. sustainability. Exactly. Uh, Actually, Kent, Kent also, I don't know if they looked at Kent, but Kent also yeah. asked for our plan a little bit right ago. Here. and Yeah. yeah. I did to them. So Kent's one of the ones. Super. So uh, you can, can you share this file via email or is it better just to put it on the city website no, or the box? Uh, I'll email it to everybody. It should be, uh, it should be fine to send out. Super. Um, yeah. So maybe we can make as an assignment, everybody who has collected data in the past on one of these sections, compare um, what, what the students have come up with to what you have and see if it makes, if things may, seem to be consistent or not. And then we can have a more in-depth discussion uh, in September as a main business item. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next item of business then is the biodiversity plan section, which I have, I've really not done anything on it since we last met. Um, I did send it around to everybody, uh, j but just yesterday. So again, if you want another assignment, um, and there's Ed has joined us. Hi, Ed. Um, take a look over that. Um, I think uh, one of the things that I'm going to want to do um, uh, maybe in coordination with Jasmine is to add some of the results and recommendations based on her thesis to that. Um, and we can try to have um, maybe a near final version of that. And maybe even if I'm really feeling ambitious, an executive summary type version that's a little bit more aligned with the way the format of the rest of our plan. So, uh, but yeah, so if sooner rather than later, if you, if you could get uh, edits back to me on that, I'm, there may be a couple of things I'm going to have to dig through old emails. There may be a few things that um, I have edits outstanding that I haven't added yet, but I don't think there was anything major. So what you're, what you're seeing is, probably fairly close to the final on that. Um, if I have some, I had some questions or some, a couple questions and a couple suggestions for that. Should sure, I just sure. send it to you? With, Please. You know, they're, just in, they're just like in the, in, you know, comments on the, on the document. Yeah. That'd be perfect. Yeah. Okay. You have my email, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Just came. Good, good, That's how I got the, yeah. Hey, just that I, I, I'm not, not that I have a great need to be seen here, but on my uh, computer, my image doesn't appear. I'm wondering if it does on others. Uh, no, we are, you are a blank screen, Austin. Um, yeah, so there are, about, there's but, a set of tools along the bottom that includes a video button. Yeah. Yeah, I've got that. I've got um, that. So what, you should, what you should do is there's a little arrow on the upper right-hand corner of that. 
You may need to click on that arrow. It allows you to toggle between different cameras. For instance, like I have a camera on my laptop, but when I'm plugged into my uh, docking station and set up, I have to make sure that it's switched over to my external camera. Okay, so you may well, have to around. fiddle around with that and see if this, things work. Okay, I'll fiddle around with it, but I'm not leaving. It the probably room. goes without saying, but I've done this before, so I'm just going to mention that if you do have, like, tape over your camera, <laughs> it won't go up. And, yeah, <laughs> I've left mine on going, why isn't my camera working? Oh, because my gaffer tape is still... Yeah, the, like, back when we were all worried, more worried about being spied on, and now we're... More on Zoom than ever. <laughs> Some of those yeah, things. What are you gonna do? Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, okay. Anything else on those two old business items? I don't think I said and asked for student data collection or biodiversity plan section. Any other comments on either of those? Oh, there's Austin. Hi, Austin. Uh, yeah, I, I think I figured it out. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Cool. Um, If there are no other questions, we'll move to the third item of old business, which is the Westside Community Association collaboration. Uh, If you dredge your memory, you may recall before COVID, uh, our commission was talking about collaborating with the Westside Community Association on a pollinator garden for Arts West. And Abby, as uh, one of the master gardeners of Athens, was kind of our lead on that. Uh, Abby, do you have any updates? I assume not much has happened with... Well, yeah. So um, we had a plan going, and then COVID derailed our plan. Mm -hmm. So we waited a little bit. And then I got into contact um, a few weeks ago last month with Emily Beveridge of Arts West and Richard of the Westside Community Association just to Mm -hmm. see maybe Mm -hmm. we could do something little. Because I know, like, I already had plants grown. Mm-hmm. and things ready. Um, and I don't think there's a whole lot of interest from the Westside Community Association mm-hmm. to do something right now, which is okay. completely understandable because a lot of stuff is going on. Um, the Westside Community Association is having a meeting at 7.30 tonight. I could bring it up there. Yeah, if you would like to. Um, I've had a couple emails back and forth with Richard. And it seems like maybe there'd be a few people, maybe there wouldn't. So the the plan isn't as concrete as it previously was. It's more of um, we have um, $100 to spend on plants, and we need to propose where we're going to put said plants and how we're going to care for said plants and propose it to um, the city. And the city has to accept it, or the city being Terry. Um so I've been working on the proposal side of things. So if there is interest, I'm still happy to do the proposal side of things. And we have a bunch of bits and pieces that could be put together. So that's the state of the pollinator garden at Arts West. A- Abby, do you have like minutes or that proposal that you could send to me? And then I could maybe send it around to the, or it's just, it's actually the executive committee that's meeting. Mm-hmm. So I could bring it up to them. Yeah, the proposal isn't isn't finalized because it's still um, That's okay. like we could play with it. Okay, yeah, I will do that. Thanks. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add, Abby, is I think I mentioned I was growing some milkweeds from seed, and I do still have a bunch of seedlings in pots. I planted some of them, but I have probably eight or ten. The mixture of um, red milkweed and butterfly weed. Oh, so really? if you, you are welcome to have them if you want to adopt them and hope that they can ma- find their way into that community yeah. garden. Um, we can maybe arrange, you can stop by and pick them up anytime. Yeah, that would be, that would be lovely. Okay. Um, I'll shoot you an email Perfect. after this, awesome. but yeah, in the, in the current proposal for a smaller garden um, at Arts West, I met with Emily, we picked out a location that we think would work and we kind of have a schedule going. So, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If we can get those milkweeds in the ground, I, they're perennial, so they should just, you know, they won't grow too much more this year, but. How big are they, Amy? Um, between like eight and 12 inches tall. Wow. They did better than mine. My seedlings are still 
really tiny. You had to put them in bigger pots with a tall root. Yeah. Tall place for roots. That was the secret I found out. Great. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. Any other discussion of that? Okay, moving along to new business then. Uh, Jasmine's gonna give us a summary of her master's thesis. I happened to watch her capstone presentation via Zoom a week or two ago now, and it was fantastic. I'm really excited about the project and I hope it's gonna be something that uh, the commission can take on as a cause. Uh, but I'm gonna, with that, let Jasmine take it away. All right. So I did try to edit this down. Um, there's a lot of background information that's important to know. So I'm going to go through it um, faster than I would if I were presenting to my committee again. Um, if my sound cuts out because I'm Ammon Millfield and sometimes the connection is not great, um, please just flag me so I don't keep talking. Um, can you guys see my screen right now? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And I'm okay, sorry, before you so, get started, Jasmine, I'll just add, if, if anybody is on a screen and the, the view of the slideshow looks very small, there's a little slider uh, that if you mouse over, you can see it, then you can, you can pull it over and make the, our views of the videos quite small, and that will enlarge the slideshow for you. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and I'm moving this, um, the, the thumbnails of all of you down so I can see my screen. Um, so if you do need to like wave me at me, put your, <laughs> unmute yourselves and let me know because I won't see you. Okay, so my thesis was um, on the effects of mowing regimes on the plants, pollinators, and roughness oops, of the channelized Hawking River's riparian zone in Athens, Ohio. And so a little bit of history real quick. Um, this postcard was from about 100 years ago and you can see the ridges um, way in the background and in the immediate foreground, you see the Hawking River. Um, so this is what Athens looks like about 110 years ago. Um, and you can see that the Hawking River looks a little bit different than it does today and it's in a different location. Um, the river has always had an issue with flooding. It is a, a river. They do flood. And we did build um, the city of Athens and Ohio University on the river's floodplain. So um, that's to be expected. Um, this photo is from 1873. You can see that the river's flooded. Um, 1907 was the worst flood event that we've seen of the Hawking River. Um, this one crested at 27 feet and had 15 deaths um, between Nel Athens and Nelsonville. So quite a lot of destruction um, to both people and property. Um, so through the 1960s, um, it just continued to flood all throughout the 20th century. And by the 60s, we were asking, um, must this happen again? And this was uh, 1967 that this flood happened. And then the following year, it did happen again. Um, another big flood. This was the second worst uh, flood event that we'd seen um, in the history of the Hawking River in Athens. And it was quite uh, destructive. The convo was just being built um, right next to the river. And of course, it flooded. And so by 1969, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers stepped in and said, we're going to take care of this problem for you. Um, and so they channelized our river. Um, so you can see the original river where it flowed um, right in the middle of, of the image, actually, and it sort of veers off to the right and uh, down. Um, that was the original course of the Hawking River um, right through campus and through town. And so now the river, um, of course, kind of circumvents most of campus. Um, so the channelization process pretty much involved widening the river, deepening it, and then straightening it along mo most of its course. Um, the channel goes for a little over five miles, about five and a half miles. It starts at, uh, just past White's Mill and then ends past the Route 50 bridge um, bypass. Um, the design is sort of a trapezoid within a trapezoid. So normal flow conditions, um, the water will be in that bottom trapezoidal um, area. And then during um, flood events, it'll fill that entire um, space of the upper banks. Where the river was um, put in used to be constructed ponds um, that were part of the ridges. And this area was really important um, to the community um, for as just a community hub. So people used to fish here, they used to ice skate here in the winter. 
um, boating and uh, all kinds of activities. And this was really a valued um, space to our community um, before the river went in. And um, the river went was basically um, went right through the spot. So all of this is obviously no longer there. So after channelization, instead of saying, okay, well, we channelized the river, we fixed the flooding problem, so now we're not going to build any more on the floodplain, um, we sort of did the opposite. We went ahead and just continued to build out onto the floodplain. Um, this was the original course of the river um, through campus. And then this is the floodplain. Um, and you can see that there's quite a lot of development um, on the floodplain itself. Um, luckily, we haven't had too many issues with flooding um, in this portion of the river. It, most of our problems are um, farther downstream um, towards East State Street. Um, this site you might not recognize. Um, this was actually East State Street. Um, it used to be an old airfield, and now um, it's been developed. So we've added quite a lot of impervious surfaces um, to the area right along the river. You can see the river flows um, right below um, all of these new uh, businesses that have gone in in the last couple decades. Um, so that sort of exasperated um, some of the flooding issues that we see down in that part of the river. So the problems that we've seen um, are, of course, habitat loss. We don't have a lot of adequate ground cover um, or microhabitats, and, of course, not a lot of tree shade down there um, along the Hawking. We've also seen a lot of biodiversity loss, and I was really excited to read through um, Amy's report that she sent out um, on biodiversity because um, it dovetails really well um, with the work that I did here. Um, but yeah, same thing, a lot of biodiversity loss. These banks were planted with non-native fescue. Um, they're constantly mowed. There's a lot of milkweed declines that we've seen um, just anecdotally. And um, of course, um, invasive species have moved in like this uh, large patch of Japanese knotweed, for example. Um, it also does still flood. So we didn't really stop the flooding entirely. We just sort of moved it down river. Um, it was designed to be a 60 year channel. The Hawking Conservancy District says it's probably a 40 year channel, but a study, um, a thesis study that was done a few years ago, put it at, as more of a five year channel. Um, so when this was put in in the early seventies, um, the I, climate change wasn't really on um, anyone's radar. Um, and I don't know that they were expecting Athens to develop the way that it did um, after. And then these are just some of the major floods. Um, these are the major, his major floods that have happened of the river, the top 20. And you can see that um, 12 of the top 20 have happened since the river um, was channelized. So I'm assuming most of you probably know what a riparian buffer is, but it's basically the space that's um, along the edges of a river that sort of um, separate the upland from the river itself. And these tend to, these areas tend to support um, a really particular set of species that can tolerate both wet and dry conditions. And they're really important um, to the greater ecosystem because they provide all of these ecosystem services that you see here. Um, our river, the, the picture that you saw before this one was actually of the Hawking River, um, but farther upstream where it wasn't channelized. Our river in Athens looks more like this. Um, it's maintained by mowing and dredging. Um, you don't see a lot of that natural vegetation growing up alongside the river here. And the reason for that is um, basically comes down to this equation, um, which is Manning's roughness equation. And this is basically just an equation uh, to give you the flow rate of what a channel would be or river um, with all of these different parameters. But the one that we're interested in here is the Manning's roughness coefficient. So this is basically saying whatever um, surface that is along a river will, uh, will influence what kind of um, flow you have or how fast the flow goes. So if you have a lot of rocks or trees, for example, that will slow down that flow of water um, and make the velocity slower. Um, so we want for this channel, we want the water to go fast. We want it to move quickly um, through the channel and out of town quickly before it has a chance to accumulate and, uh, and flood the town. So again, normal flow, the water would be in the bottom part of the river. Um, you can see that as it rises um, to bankful, um, it can fill up the entire trapezoid. 
it was built to do this. Um, that's what it's supposed to do. But the area that we're concerned about is those green banks that you see. Those are the areas that are mowed. And um, we're looking to see if basically we can allow those to grow without slowing down um, that velocity too much. Um, trees are typically a problem for the Army Corps of Engineers um, because they tend to fall over, their root balls come up, um, which can jeopardize the actual levee structure itself. Um, and then things get caught in them, um, debris flowing by, and that further um, worsens the flood potential. So trees might be out of um, the question for the Army Corps um, to do anything, but I was wondering basically if there was any room for improvement or some kind of compromise that could be made. Right now, the banks sort of look like this. Um, it's grass. It's often overgrown during the summer. Um, but I was basically looking at can we allow plants to grow and will that really um, slow that, that velocity to the point where it's not worth even putting them in. Um, I encourage you guys, if you have a chance, to look up um, this thesis. It's by Pizzotti. It was um, basically on the people's perceptions of the channelized Hawking River. Um, and it was done 15 years ago, so it's a little bit old. But it gave me a lot of insight into what the community thinks about the river. And most of um, the people that he interviewed were skewed to sort of the older generation that remembers um, the time before the channel was put in. Um, so I thought it was really interesting from a historical perspective to see um, what they had to say. And really, um, it really gave me some insight into the loss that they felt by uh, by the river going in, by the river being changed, and then by those um, that community hub that I had mentioned, all those ponds and whatnot, being replaced by this river that's not really very usable um, by the public. So basically, I was looking at, um, can we do something with pollinators, maybe? We might not be able to put trees in, but can we put flowers in, which, are, um, which would put less um, friction into the river? Um, as you guys know, pollinators are really vital. Um, over 80% of the world's flowering plants rely on them to reproduce. Um, a third of our agricultural outputs rely on pollinators, which is, of course, an economic issue as well. And both insect pollinators and the plants they assist um, comprise the bottom of the food chain for all kinds of other species. Um, and you guys know that biodiversity in general is a huge um, ongoing issue. We are in the sixth uh, mass extinction right now. So um, getting our pollinator um, populations back to a healthy level um, is really important part of this puzzle. So my main questions are what are the effects of the mowing regimes on the plants, pollinators, and roughness of the channelized Hawking River's riparian zone? And is a partial restoration of the channelized river's riparian zone possible without jeopardizing flood protection? So I picked out these sampling sites. Um, I identified some sites that had been left to grow. Um, so I identified them by their early successional or late successional. The so early successional sites were those that hadn't been mowed in one to two growing seasons. And late successional were those that hadn't been mowed in three plus growing seasons. And I paired those with um, adjacent mowed sites. So these are the ones that were upstream and then downstream as well. And I basically looked at only the um, upper banks. So a mowed site would sort of look like the bank that's on the right of your screen and an unmowed site, um, either early or late successional would look like the, um, the picture on your left. So I did a pollinator survey first and basically asked, is there a difference in pollinator presence between the treatment types? So between those early, late or mowed successional treatments. And I monitored them and um, just basically logged them according to what kind of um, insect I was looking at. And then I also did a vegetation survey. Is there a difference in vegetative characteristics between treatment types? I identified all the plants in my quadrats by their species. Um, they were measured by their percent cover. Um, and then I looked at a whole bunch of different um, parameters um, in regard to the plants that were there. So results. Okay, so. Um, as expected, this just basically gives you the life form um, of each treatment. So graminoids are grasses. So the top box you see there um, 
almost 78 percent of mown treatment sites were grasses, which is not um, surprising. 32 um, percent were forbs. So those are herbaceous flowering plants that just happen to be um, cut down very, very low. Um, so uh, almost a third um, were actually regular um, flowering plants. Um, at the early treatments, 81% were Forbes, um, which is surprising, um, whereas the late successional treatments, only about two-thirds were Forbes, um, but there were quite a lot of grasses coming in um, in those treatment types. And this is important because, like I said, um, the Army Corps doesn't want woody debris. Um, they don't want woody growth or woody encroachment um, in the channel, so there isn't really a whole lot of woody encroachment as it is. They do mow it a lot. Um, but if it's not going to be grasses, the next best thing for our purposes, um, getting this area back to like an ecologically sound um, area would be um, to put forbs in. And um, some of this is going to look different for those of you that saw the, um, the presentation I did, because I did have to redo a little bit of it. So um, you'll get some new information here. Um, but these are the species composition um, of the plants that I saw. So basically what we see here um, is the early sites were sort of nested within the late treatments. It was sort of a subset of what we found or what I found in the late um, successional treatments. And the mown um, species were almost totally different than either of the other two. And uh, that continued throughout um, the, the sampling period. I sampled three times and um, I sampled from summer to fall. So I had to separate them because of course the, the plants were changing as the seasons changed. Um, but this trend didn't change too much. It was pretty much the same um, throughout the sampling period. Um, this one is hard to read. I had to redo this one and make it look like this instead of my nice box, box plots that I had. Um, but basically what this is telling us is that um, there was a significant difference in diversity, um, but the mown treatments were actually fairly diverse. Um, there's a lot growing, going on in those grown, um, in those mowed sites. There's a lot of different species um, in them, um, which I found surprising. Um, but to our native sites, if you guys look at the black dots, if you can see those, those give you the predicted um, mean of each, uh, of each treatment type within each sampling period. Um, so basically you see the black dot is lower for the mown um, sites here. And that's basically saying that there are more invasive or non-native species in the mown sites than there are in either, um, than either of the other treatment types that were allowed to grow. I also looked at noxious plants um, because this area is along um, where people like to congregate along the bike path. And there's a lot of poison hemlock, especially in there. Um, so I wanted to sort of keep an eye on that because it's not really managed um, right now, as far as I can tell. And for noxious plants, those were highest in the early successional sites and lowest in the mown sites, which um, isn't that surprising really. Um, leaf area index is sort of a measure of um, the structural, comp the structure, like the physical structure of a plant community. Um, and this sort of gave me some insight into how much um, roughness each of these areas would add. So if there was a lot of leaves in there, um, a lot of different things going on, the area would probably um, give more friction to the channel. So leaf area index was highest in the early successional sites, um, middle in the late successional sites, and of course, lowest in the mown. Overall, it changed a little bit toward the last sampling period. Um, greatest height, again, same idea um, as far as giving me some insight into um, what sort of roughness would be given or added by each of these treatment types. Um, earliest in the, or highest in the early, um, and then again, down to mown. Uh, pollinator results. This is just showing, this is an NMDS plot again. It's just basically showing um, that there is a lot of difference between the early and the mown treatments. Um, and there's some overlap in the late treatments between the two. Um, and in the early successional sites, uh, bumblebees, beetles, and honeybees um, were most likely to be found in those sites, um, which are all important pollinators. 
Um, I did this again for August and September. I couldn't do an N NMDS plot for the later months because there were so many um, zero counts that it just wouldn't have made any sense. But it was pretty much the same results. And then this just shows you the raw data. This might be easier to read. Um, the salmon color are the early successional sites. So um, they start out a little bit lower. Um, these are the pollinator counts. They start out a little bit lower than the late, but then in the second sampling period, um, the early successional sites have the highest um, by quite a bit of pollinator counts. Um, and then they all sort of drop by October, November. Um, and this is pretty much the trend that I saw across all metrics um, for pollinators was that they, they were highest in the late successional sites early on toward the later summer, early fall, the early successional sites um, took over. And then by the end, everything dropped off. And my, my theory is that, um, or my hypothesis is that um, those, there were more native plants in the late successional sites um, but by the, by August, September, a lot of those are probably starting to die back. And those sites also had more grasses. So pollinators were basically looking for floral resources, um, wherever they could find them. And so by August, September, you'd find them more often, um, where the flowers were. And even if they weren't native flowers, the flowers were there and that's where the pollinators were. Again, seconds that pollinators rested, um, th that was counted as well, and same sort of pattern. Um, monarchs, I just basically, if I saw a monarch, I tallied um, whether or not I saw one in the site because um, they're easy to identify, they're charismatic, and I was just curious if monarchs, uh, were how they were using each site. And it was the same exact pattern that I saw for the other pollinators where they started out higher in the late and then they just took over um, in the early successional sites by the late summer. And then of course, October, November, you don't see very many monarchs at all. So I also did the hydrological assessment um, and basically um, assigned Manning's and coefficients to each of the treatment types. Um, some of them were based on um, actual observations that I saw. Some of them were based on the literature um, and some of them are based on hypothetical like management scenarios. And those are these here. So I basically looked at, look, if we were to allow um, growth, managed growth um, in the summertime, what would the coefficient be? In the fall, what would the coefficient be? And so on. Um, so this is the change in flow rate, and these sites are listed from um, upstream on the left to downstream. You can see that generally um, for all different treatment types, the flow rate um, generally decreases as you move downstream. Um, the biggest change in flow rate is in the hospital unmown site um, between a hypothetical scenario of letting um, the plants grow on both banks in the summer and an all mown scenario, mowing both, both sides of both banks. Um, but even that was not, um, not a super big change considering that the flow rate here is the highest of all sites. Um, and that's up by the hospital, by Oblenus, um, where it doesn't really tend to flood very much. Velocity, um, change in velocity is pretty much the same thing, which is expected. If you guys do notice, um, in the library unmown site, um, down at the bottom where it dips, um, on both of these graphs, the, the one that I showed you before and this one, um, that's quite low. And I think that it has more to do with um, channel geometry than it did with um, adding roughness to the channel. Uh, because this this trend held um, across all different scenarios. So right there in the channel, the channel bends pretty um, drastically, and then it narrows a lot, and then the banks themselves are just not very large, um, so they can't hold as much water as some of the other sites. And then this is the percent change in velocity. So this um, shows everything from no change at all or hardly any change to um, a moderate change in velocity. Um, so we could take this and basically um, more, do a more fine-tuned assessment of where we'd like to see growth and where it might um, not make as much sense um, for flood protection. Looking at past trends, um, 
these are the last five years of um, hydrology, basically for the for the channel. So these are this is a gauge height, and November and um, or October and November um, are highlighted in yellow. And you guys can see that generally, um, with the exception of a couple of weird years, um, these are some of the driest months that we tend to see in the Hawking River um, in Athens. So. Um, up until now, the Hawking Conservancy District's reason for mowing through the summer and not so much um, in the fall is because they say that the fall is wet and, um, you know, they don't want to mow on slippery conditions or um, if it freezes over. Um, I don't have the freeze date on here. It was in my thesis, but it doesn't typically, we don't get prolonged um, freeze uh periods in the Hawking or along the Hawking or in Athens in general um, in October and uh, not so much in November either. Um, these are, this is a graph of basically the highest recorded floods of the Hawking. Um, and I just graphed them by what month they occurred in. So these are all of the highest recorded floods ever to happen. Um, in the river. And you guys can see here that June and July, the middle of summer, um, really are very dry overall. Um, we just don't get a lot of rain overall. It seems like we do sometimes, but um, the, the river doesn't flood um, terribly in the summer months. And then October and November are very low risk um, for flood events as well. Um, now, if you look January to May, those are the times that we really uh, should be concerned about um, flood events. So a recap, by October, November, all pollinator counts had significantly dropped. Um, the leaf area index and the greatest height were the highest in the early successional treatment, which leads to more roughness. The percent of native plants overall was the highest in the late successional treatment, and it stated about 50% in the early successional treatments. Um, the early successional sites had the highest percentage of herbaceous plants, and the risk of flooding appears to be low during the active growing season and through the fall. So given all that, um, my recommendations are that um, the benefits of allowing this area to grow um, and all of these ecosystem benefits that you guys see here far outweigh the risk of flooding um, in the river during the time that we are concerned with through the, through the growing season and the fall. Um, and a lot of environmental damage can really be avoided with just more thoughtful consideration to the timing that the mowing is occurring. So I'm not saying that we should stop mowing altogether, but um, for example, this site here um, was one of my sites up uh, toward the, the beginning of the channel. And I came upon it in August and it had been mowed back like six feet. I'm not really sure why, um, but it had just been mowed back six feet. And this had also been um, the area where I'd seen the most milkweed growing in any of the sites I'd been to. Um, so all of that milkweed was just totally mowed down. Um, those seed pods were not mature. I collected as many as I could, but they weren't, they weren't mature. Um, they weren't viable. Um, so if we just, a little bit more thoughtful consideration, I think would go a long way. So this research supports an active and deliberate management strategy, which respects the responsibility for flood protection, but also recognizes that there's an opportunity here for better environmental stewardship. <clears throat> so I would recommend waiting um, to mow until act after October 15th. Um, this map that you see here is um, was made by ODOT um, by it was made for by ODOT for um, monarchs in particular. Um, but you can see our area um, also says after October 15th. Um, I'd mow the upper banks annually after pollinators have moved on, but before the flood season. So in that October, November window is really sort of the sweet spot, I think, of when we want to mow the banks so that it's ready. Um, the banks are ready for the spring rains and for any flooding that might be happening um, the following season. And then I really think that we could possibly reallocate um, some of our current mowing resources that the Hawking Conservancy District is allocated um, to more active and intentional management that focuses on the control of invasive species and any woody encroachment. Um, I found a, um, what was it? I found one document that said that the Hawking Conservancy District spent $72,000 a year um, on equipment and contracts um, just for repairs and services alone. 
Um, I think that was 2013. Um, so yeah, some of that money could probably be reallocated to just more, um, more fine tuned, uh, management strategy. Um, Abby, you'll probably recognize this graph. You are accredited in my thesis. Um, we did this uh, for a class. Um, but yeah, these are just some of the plant rest recommendations. Some of them um, prefer more moist soil. Some of them prefer roadside. So depending on where we plant on the banks, um, some of these plants will do better um, than others. Um, future studies should look at a soil analysis um, so that we can figure out if it's better to plant actual plants or if it would be make more sense to seed the banks. Um, a cost benefit analysis that includes um, all of the things that we mentioned, the risk of flooding, but also um, the, the many benefits that pollinators bring to an economy. Um, and then the Army Corps of Engineers is going to have to come out probably to do a follow-up study if we're going to be allowed to do any of this. Um, and the only way that I think that they'll come out is if the community really pushes for this and backs it. Um, this is a, um, the image that you see here was a, a sign that I designed with Hilferty um, of the Hawking River. And I think it's supposed to go up at the ridges. I don't know if it's actually ever went up or not because of COVID, um, but it's supposed to go up at the ridges. And it's basically just an educational sign that um, goes through a lot of that history that I just shared with you guys, letting people know like, this is the Hawking, this is its history, and this is its potential. It doesn't have to necessarily look the way that it does now. Um, there is some precedence for restoration projects like this. This is the San Antonio River in Texas. Um, it was also channelized in the last century. And um, through a lot of community efforts, um, they were able to convince the Army Corps to come back and do another um, survey of the area and to work with them to um, do a restoration project of the river. Um, you can see they have a bike path like ours. It's not really um, too dissimilar. And when they did this um, restoration project, they saw a lot of um, other benefits from this. Um, this whole region actually ended up becoming um, revitalized because people were spending more time, more money. People like to spend time, um, we're in pretty areas apparently, <laughs> places that look nice. Um, and so yeah, the whole downtown was really revitalized through this project. I would encourage you guys to look up um, the San Antonio River Authority website, they have um, some really nice documentaries on the project and how they were able to, to get this done. So this is another quote from that um, Pizzotti, um, People's Perception of the Hawking River um, thesis. It says, the river could be naturalized a lot more. I'd like to see some walking paths, maybe go right down to the water's edge so people can get down and experience the river rather than just from a distance. I've been to a lot of different places around different types of rivers and ours is as ugly as you can get. It is just a big flood channel. I wish we could do more, but there's a lot of education that has to happen. I think the Conservancy District has to be convinced that more could be done and nobody has really tried to do that very much. They've planted more trees, but there's still an attitude of mostly making it look like a golf course rather than a riparian zone. And that's it. That was the fast version. <laughs> Tried. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jasmine about her presentation or about her work? I'd like Sam? to chime in. Um, oh, yeah, Jamie. Jasmine, while you were speaking, I was walking along the Hawking River Channel. So I got to watch it as <laughs> you were talking, and oh. it really added such color to my understanding of <laughs> the river. Yeah. So that was really enjoyable. Um, and yeah, all that you say, I see early successional trees, but also early successional herbaceous for sure. Um, and I'm curious, the other thing that I've noticed this river doing over the 20 years that I've watched it is creating pretty large, um, you know, bars. solid... Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, sandbars, right? Sandbars, yes, that's the word I'm looking yeah. for. So yeah. what are your thoughts on these sandbars? Are they of benefit? I mean, I understand that a river that flows straight is the worst kind of river. It needs to have 
you know, bend and form. And I think it's what the Hawking's trying to do, but um, what are your thoughts yeah. on, on that addition? Yeah. So um, the sandbars are the result of sedimentation from upstream um, and yeah, a river will eventually, you know, nature finds a way, right? Um, it'll eventually do its thing. And without the dredging happening, it, it just keeps um, depositing more sediment into the, the channel there. Um, in the 80s, the, the Army Corps did come out and they did do a follow-up study um, and basically found that it didn't make... Um, it wasn't cost effective to continue dredging at the rate that the conservancy district was trying to dredge because they couldn't keep up with the rate of sedimentation. Um, mm. So they sort of allowed them to let some of that go. Um, so the sandbars are, they're good for um, the ecology of the river. They're not necessarily good for, um, for its role as a flood channel. Um, so it depends on who you're asking, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, then the other, other, can I just ask one more quick thing? Um, I know that it's yet to be entirely determined where the city is going to install sort of distributed solar, ground mounted solar along this whole um, city owned property site. But um, I wonder factoring that into the pollinator garden option. I know it's been discussed and I've heard Andrew Cheeky say and others say, you know, we really are interested to see a pollinator um, planting go along with the ground mount system so that the mowing can be um, limited and more manageable. <laughs> um, but have you followed that at all? Or do you know anything about? Um, no, I didn't know that solar that. was being considered for, for that. Is it being considered for, for what area? Yeah, so um, there's a uh, the city has accepted a bid from Third Solar, Third Sun Solar, to install up to two megawatts of solar throughout the campus of Ooh. the Athens Community Center. It's to power the water treatment facility as well as the pool and other facilities like in the campus. And so, yeah, I think the 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 design is still. Um, in progress. And so um, it's just something maybe to keep an eye on as we yeah, talk about, you know, further plans for shifting mowing schedules and planting schedules. That sounds like a cool thesis, like another thesis. Um, yeah. 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 Maybe I, I know there's a lot of people that are into um, green infrastructure projects and that sort of thing. And um, I don't know, integrating a pollinator garden with a solar um, field would be cool. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thanks. I, I, I don't know that. Got it. <laughs> just, just to follow up with Sarah, I do have a number of resources on integrating pollinators with solar, and there are some considerations, like you may want to keep the vegetation low right near the panels for fire risk yeah. and maintenance and hazards and that kind of thing. So you might want to use sense. like low clover near the panels and then taller stuff on the edge. But we don't have, we can take that offline and talk about it, but I'm happy to be a resource on that. Yes. Yeah. Sam, I think you also had a question for Jasmine. Great, thank you. Uh, Jasmine, it was wonderful. I had learned a lot and uh, it was really well done. Um, I realize that the focus of your thesis was the channel, but I'm wondering if you have information on the impact of the channelized portion of the hawking on the downstream. I'm really more interested in the downstream where I, I would imagine that the impact is greater downstream than, than upstream. Yeah. What the impact over the last 50 years has been on the downstream portion? Um, my thesis didn't cover that, but there have been other theses theses that um, that have. There was a thesis I forget which one, um, what his name was, but yeah, there was one that did the upstream and one that did the plan form changes in the downstream reach and and effects from from the channel. And I think the basic like the big takeaway was that um, flooding is worse downstream than it was before. That was my big question because I've been saying that for a lot of years, and I want to make sure. Yeah. But he was an expert. Yeah. Besides Especially the, lane, the way was there was, yeah, there was a whole thesis done on that bridge that was put in right at the end of the channel. And it basically created a back flooding uh, scenario where, you know, it's like a little dam. And so it stops, it slows the river down right at the end there and then back floods. And so you see a lot of flooding, you know, Walmart parking lot and State Street and that sort of thing. Um, 
but yeah the the levees there are not very big either like it's, it's kind of interesting how they decided to i don't know i don't know, really know i wasn't there but um but yeah they're just like five feet of levee i mean it's not really that surprising that it floods down there given just the geometry of the channel i don't know if it has a whole lot to do with what's growing to be honest okay thank you yeah any other questions for jasmine Oh. Yeah, just a quick one, Jasmine. Did you communicate any of uh, your findings to uh, the the district or have any meetings with them about any of this and any any? I had a meeting. On what you got? Yeah, I had a meeting early on with Mark Holdcroft, um, very early on, and you know, basically got permission to be in there and told him what I was doing. And he said, okay, that's fine. I won't mow these certain areas. Um, but I have not given him my results. I don't, I I'll try. I'll try. We'll <laughs> see what he says. He's been doing his job a long time, you know? So yeah. Yeah. And, I, I and definitely didn't want to get it. I didn't want to get in there and tell him, you know, how to do the job that he's been doing for 20 or 30 years, you know? <laughs> In my recollection from a meeting I had with Mark years ago about the mowing, um, and I, I, it's been a while, so I might have it wrong now, but it was that the, the management plan um, was approved basically when the channel project happened. Yeah, and, 1972. And yeah, and then it's like in order to it change the management it. plan, all of the government, all of the communities – along the Hawking river plus the feds and the state all have to approve it. Something, yeah. something like that. And the, 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 the political challenge of getting everybody on board to allow for change was so great that, um, yeah, it, just, it hasn't been changed. Right. It hasn't been changed since 1972. The only, um, the only thing they really changed was just saying you don't have to dredge as often as you did before. Um, I think it's time for an update probably, but yeah, that's true. Like it will take, yeah. it's, it's going to have to take a big lift, yeah. for, for anything to happen. The community is going to have to be a hundred percent behind a change like this. And, right. you know, when I was out there sampling, people were stopping me all the time asking me, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, why are you out here sweating your butt off, you know, in the hot sun with no trees? Um, and as soon as I told them, people were like, oh, my God, it would be so great if we could have this, if we could have that. Why can't we just, you know, a, there was a lot of interest, um, but there's been no organization around that interest. So right. I think that it's really, you know, a community group is going to have to come together and decide that they want to see this happen and, and take it on. Hey, can yeah. I just Thanks, ask Jasmine. That's great. Jasmine, Austin? Yeah, did you say that the Army Corps of Engineers did this project originally? Yes. And are they still involved in some fashion in the maintenance? Um, I don't think that they're actively involved. Um, they oversee it still. The Huntington District does. Um, well, why I'm asking is because um, I would think that if they have any say, you know, we got to get buy-in from them Yeah. for any change. So uh, did you share these <laughs> results with them? Or are you going to share these results with them? Um, I can, but again, like, I think that me sending a thesis to the army Corps will just be like, Hey, that's cool. I really think that this has to accompany community push okay. because okay. no, they, they're not going to care about doing this just because I did a study. Sure. They're going to have to hear that, that the community really, really wants this and that they're being vocal about it. Um, okay. I think for anything to really change. So I, I would love for this research to be a part of that, but I don't think it'll be enough to convince them. That makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, they Great see thoughts. it as a, ch that river for them is a channel and it's a flood channel and that's what it's meant to be. It's not a, you know, it's not there to support right. any sort of ecology or whatever. Um, that's its purpose. So right. yeah. Their job is done. Yeah. So, so I have a question. Um, so for the city to show interest on a level that can get their attention to want to um, uh, listen to our the changes that we'd like to see them make to the management of it, that could start with us, right, to get something rolling. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm new to this commission, so I don't know. Make a proposal to city council and get the yep. administration behind it and 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 the community behind it. Maybe do what 
what else can we do? Uh, a petition drive, uh, education, what? Yeah, I, I think that sounds like like the right path. I mean, like I'm, I am new to this commission, so I'm not totally, um, you know, I don't know what it's capable of doing. Um, totally. But, but yeah, um, I think that would be the good first step. And I would really, I would really, I would really go back and look at, look at the San Antonio river project and maybe if you can find others like it and see what they did. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, there's like an hour long documentary on their website that just sort of goes through the process and they have a really nice um, site. I mean, it's really cool what they did. They, they incorporated culture and um, and the environment and everything else. You know, they have like this whole like the mission reach and, it you know, stops along the river and, and kiosks that show you like this spot is whatever. You know, we could do that. We have so many historical sites along that river. You know, the ridges alone is is beautiful um and it's just sitting there as a resource that we're not totally tapping into yet mm -hmm. when was the san antonio project done recently no. like in i think it really started to take off in the last 20 years um and then it was completed i think in the last 10 15 years because i think i was there about 15 years ago and it was like being in disneyland and, al along the river if, if i'm remembering correctly <laughs> yeah some of it some nothing. of it's like posh. <laughs> some of it some of it's very posh like they made some of it look like really like you know kind of venice style um channel you know with like dining right next to it yeah, and then yes. other parts of it are very you know more natural looking yeah. but they've also i know i know governor and i know uh, mayor patterson for example has talked a lot about um adding like waterways and water trails um to our area and you know <laughs> i think it would be a nice first step yeah so i want to be mindful of the time we were already a little bit after seven but i would really like us to continue to brainstorm on this to think about you know can we i actually don't know what the process is if, if for the commission to make a formal recommendation to the council to investigate this more, to you know, to, to try to formally approach either the Conservancy District or the Army Corps, or both about a change of management. Um, so I'm, I, we'd have to think a little bit about process, and we probably don't have time to do that tonight. But I'd like to continue yeah. to think about this. The other thing I, I want to ask Paul, and I feel a little remiss in the fact that I'm even asking. Um, does our comprehensive plan, or did the listening sessions around the comprehensive plan? get illicit responses about changes to the river or a desire for the river to be more welcoming? Not really. Um, interesting that you ask that today, though. Uh, one of the first emails I received this morning was from somebody asking if there was still an opportunity to comment on that draft. And I said, yes. And he said, great, I want to comment about uh, improving the, the channel. Um, similar to exactly Jasmine's example, I think, of San Antonio. And so... Um, no, there wasn't much about that. Um, a lot of those, you know, it's a question of, of what questions are asked and who, who's, a, who's attending the meetings. Um, by all means, if uh, anybody does want to give a little bit more feedback um, relating to the plan, please send it in, especially if okay. it's on a topic like this. We have had some meetings, just like Jasmine said, Mayor Patterson's been, and several others have been interested in finding ways to, to better utilize the river for recreational purposes. Terry Moore from Arts, Parks and Rec, the director there, she's also interested in more outdoor recreation, including uh, access to the river. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of the conversations that were had on this have been, it's been, it's been a couple years ago, uh, and Chris Schmiel and Jesse Powers from the county brought in, and a few others brought in somebody from, uh, I think from, from D.C. who was interested in some of these items. I, I want to say is with the Forest Service or the Park Service. Mm -hmm. um, but the example that most people were thinking of was, um, is it the Miami River near Dayton and Springfield, where they've, they've, they've converted a lot of that into more of a kind of like a kayaking recreation type. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I think, but uh, it seems like maybe a combination of that with San Antonio River is a, it's really exciting to, to think about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe we can have everybody put their thinking caps on more homework guys um, between now and next month and um, think about both, you know, what, 
what our recommendations might be, and then also what the process might be to move them forward um, as far as gauging public opinion, talking to council, talking to the mayor, uh, and then hopefully eventually moving forward with um, a, a more formal proposal to the Hawking District to make some changes, Conservancy District. And with that, I think we only had one other item of business, which is backyard chickens, which I'm really excited about. So hopefully everybody will <laughs> stick around for a couple more minutes. I don't remember. I don't know who was going to talk about that. That was me again. Sorry. Okay, cool. So like, no worries. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I had just brought this up at the last meeting. Um, and actually, after I had brought it up, I don't know if you guys are on the Athens West Side page. I think you are, Ed. Um, but somebody posted, and I have the post up here. It says, does anyone want five adolescent laying hens for free? Got them to feed myself during the pandemic, but the city of Athens apparently would rather me go to a grocery store than be safe and self-sufficient. They demand I remove them ASAP or they will start fining me. What a lovely, empathetic government we have. Huh. Also, it was a neighbor who complained to the code enforcer, whoever you are, I hope you feel good about taking food away from the less fortunate. And then he posted, I wonder if we could get the city to vote on this again in the fall. I heard it was close vote last time it was proposed. So after he posted this, he got 70 comments. Um, as far as I could tell, nobody that commented was opposed to backyard chickens. Um, everybody was basically WTF. Um, why can't we have chickens here? If New York City can have chickens, I don't see why Athens can't when we're you know supposed to be this mecca of um sustainability and you know this granola town i guess um so yeah i just wanted to bring it forward because the community um from what i've seen does seem to there is interest um and uh i think that this could be a good time for it with the pandemic happening we we want people to be able to um, feed themselves and um i have chickens they're a joy i love them um, and they're a lot of fun and they've been great for my kids um, to hang out with during the pandemic and to learn from. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to bring it up for discussion and, and put it on everyone's radar. Do we I, know, oh, I was just going to say, do we know what the city's objection to chickens is? Sam, do you, Paul, do you guys know? I'll just say that um, uh, I, I think I told Jasmine this when, um, she brought it up with uh, earlier is that uh, I've also heard uh, requests for this change from the um, east side uh, and, and neighbor is very close to me. Um, and uh, I inquired, this is uh, probably six months ago, I inquired with the uh, code enforcement office about some of the questions that the resident brought up. And um, I was given answers that were uh, that concerned public health issues, and I didn't fully investigate to see how accurate they were. I passed them on to the resident, and the resident was very understanding, but I'm all for looking into this, Jasmine, and, and um, uh, you know, discovering why we have that on the books. I was not on council when that was, um, whenever that ordinance was passed, Paul. I don't know if you know any more. Um, it's been a long time. That was about 10 years ago. I want to say, mm -hmm. um, my recollection, there's, there's kind of two, two parts to it. One of which is that most of the language relating to, uh, keeping of domestic animals and there is language specifically about the keeping of fowl, um, or something like that. And that is in the, the zoning code, which is, um, chapter 23. And it's not much language. It's just, it's basically just says that, uh, you can only keep fowl, um, in, in, they, they have to be kept in like coops and, uh, a coop must be, it's like 500 feet from any other lot line. And so that basically excludes almost all, all, all real estate within the city, except for a few of the more, um, there, there's a handful of estates, uh, where you could do it basically because they have so much land. Um, when it was brought forward to the planning commission and to city council, my recollection, I could be wrong was that. Uh, at that time, the members of the planning commission weren't su super into it, um, nor was most of the members of council. But there was there was um, there was considerable opposition from community members who were absolutely opposed to it. Period, um, and they were you know they they came to council meetings and they came to planning commission meetings, and um, uh, there was not a lot of people that were coming to speak on behalf of it. 
And it was just one of those things. There was no real, nobody really leading the charge who um, wanted to move it forward. Do you know what their opposition was? Uh, I think it's just some of the things, Sam, uh, nuisance, noise, odors. Um, there are some people who said that, you know, we moved to the city to get away from the country, stuff like that, positions like that. Yeah, but. Yeah. You know, um, it, I will. Basic concerns, I would say. Um, there's issues, you know, what happens if it's a rooster and they, uh, pretty yeah. basic yeah. stuff. I, I'm sure we have planning commission. I know we have planning commission meetings from those meetings and or from that mm-hmm. time period. I will I will um, take a look at the the code in Arlington, Virginia, which is a, a very posh suburb of D.C. Uh, and an older suburb, you know, a lot of 1920s houses similar to a lot of Athens, so not huge lots, um, because they've recently allowed chickens. And I will look at their language. I'm sure there are limitations like, you know, you can only have like three oh, yeah. and yeah. not a lot of rooster and yeah. stuff like right. that. So I will see. I, that, I, I'm assigning myself that piece of homework uh, as and well. To that's, look what at. We, that's what the city was looking at. Amy was was language to try to address all of those issues, and um, I, I think I'll ultimately out- there just wasn't much. There just wasn't really political will to push yes. it forward because of there was enough citizen opposition. But that- times change. That was yeah. like I said. That was about a decade I'd like ago. To, now. Yeah, I'll add. Um, I remember in two thousand five, um, community food initiatives was um, really pushing to encourage the city to change the zoning code. Um, and I, I do remember it was, um, you know, that was during, um, a former mayor who, you know, definitely was a little more status quo. And I think that, you know, we are in a different time. We do have a a more proactive local government. I think it is a good time. Um, I'm happy to help also as a chicken owner and, um, you know, someone who, who has also heard from many, many residents. I know the person who, unfortunately was evicted and unable to keep their chickens. And yeah, it's a, it seems to me as though there's a common sense approach to this that really will benefit Mm -hmm. city residents who want to be part of the, um, you know, poultry owning community. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're keeping egg layers and you're not keeping roosters and you're taking care of your coop, you can really protect your fellow neighbors from nuisance. You can protect uh, your your animals. Um, it's it's very doable in an urban setting. So I'm happy to help with that as well. Yeah, I, w- I wanted to add that I did very briefly mention this to Mayor Patterson during another meeting um, when we were just sitting, you know, waiting for everybody to join a Zoom meeting. And he said he would be in favor for of it if someone um, or if council brought it before him. So he seems to be on board. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of different rules that you can put in place. No roosters, limit the number of chickens. And we have the um, composting program in place now. So that can help with a lot of the waste issues yeah, um, true. for sure. Um, honestly, though, I have nine chickens and I haven't noticed. I mean, we've got more space out here, but I haven't noticed a whole lot of bad smells. Um, you know, and I really don't clean it as often as I should. Um, so. <laughs> But the composting program is there for um, for people who who need it in smaller spaces. So you all can see in the chat the chat window that uh, the government channel staff posted a link to the council meeting, one of the council meetings from 2010 about it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's all I got. I just wanted to put it on people's radar. Get us talking again. It might be a good time for it. Yeah, so it sounds like the process on that would be, since it would be a zoning change, it would have to be approved first by the Planning Commission and then go up to council. Is that right? Yeah, uh, basically, yeah, the the Planning Commission uh, at a minimum has to review and then make a recommendation up to City Council. Um, If if council is on board with what the Planning Commission um, is recommending, then council can approve with a simple majority. Uh, if council wants to make changes to what the planning commission recommends, then uh, a supermajority needs to override the planning commission. It's, I will say it's always helpful. I work with the planning commission uh, all the time as well. Um, it is more. It is a lot more helpful, in my opinion, to provide them with kind of details as to what changes to the code you want to have rather than just ask them to change code with respect to a topic. 
um, because they are also very limited with time and have a lot of items on their agendas as well. And that Amy, works a lot better. that's perfect segue, Amy. I was just going to yeah. say, if you're looking for other cities that have um, code about chickens, um, I think San Diego. Our my husband's cousin. We visited him last year in San Diego, and you know, just right in the heart of a mm -hmm. in San Diego, they had chickens. So I imagine they have something in their code about it. So I will look at San Diego yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm sending a. I just sent okay. a, I don't know how up to date it is, but it has a list of Ohio cities that apparently um, allow chickens okay. and what their basic rules are, not okay. the whole code, but. Cool. Okay. Well, gang, it is 20 after seven. Uh, we've kept you longer than we usually try to. Um, so I think we all have a lot of homework for next time, which is fine. <laughs> Me especially. I think I gave myself the most. So. Um, I don't feel bad about it. Um, does anyone else have anything for the good of the order? Uh, there is, I will say, to say real quickly, the one other thing that's on the agenda uh, is um, Wayne National Forest. They have released their final assessment, uh, so they're not accepting comments on that, although they are in general, that they are still taking comments on the wilderness process and on the species of conservation concern. Um, so they, if anyone's really super interested in that, ping me and I will, I'll loop you into that process. I don't want to take a whole lot of time to talk about it. Um, and I did get it, just get a message from Sarah that we need for next, next time we need to get uh, solar on the agenda. Actually, I have to go back to her mess her message, but um, I think there's is it a solar friendly legislation that we need to get? Okay, yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll forward that to you, Paul. We'll try to make sure we get on that, that on the agenda for next time. Thanks. Anything else? Is, is the is the is the next month is sec September second is the meeting? That's correct. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, if you're talking, Sarah, you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. With that, can we get a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. I'll second it. I'll second okay. it. Okay. All right. Ed and Elaine, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Talk Amy. Thanks, Megan. Glad to have you.